This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about shutting the exits and boiling the frogs. And this is something I've been warning about for years, but now we finally have clear evidence that central bankers understand what an enemy Bitcoin is to their policies. I've made a couple other videos called Shut the Exits, Boil the Frogs, but we really are here now. Minneapolis Fed research paper finds banning or taxing Bitcoin can help maintain permanent budget deficits. A new research paper from the Fed Bank of Minneapolis suggests that governments can either tax or ban quote unquote fixed supply private sector bubble assets that are not a claim on any real resources. In other words, Bitcoin, as we're going to see. And why would they do this? They would do this in order to ensure the long-term viability of large and permanent budget deficits. In other words, government spending more than it brings in in taxes. So some necessary background for this. U.S. government debt owed is many multiples of the current size of the economy and even the current money supply. So we have GDP, which is not the greatest measurement, but a fair measurement of the U.S. economy, the size of the economy currently at 29 trillion. We have the M2 money supply for the U.S. dollar at 21 trillion. So 29 trillion, 21 trillion. When we t when we take a look at the debt, U.S. national debt, public debt, almost 36 trillion. So much larger than the money supply or the GDP. And then when we look at the total debt, which includes U.S. unfunded liabilities, all the entitlement spending that's coming, we're at 220 trillion, that's approximately 10x the current M2 money supply. So this is what we mean by having a huge debt overhang. So why can't we just tax the rich and pay off the debt that way? Here's why, because the total unfunded liabilities are 220 trillion total wealth of all the billionaires in the United States, if you just were to tax them at 100%, do a wealth tax on their assets is 6 trillion. So again, for the debt here, we have 36 trillion, 220 trillion and then billionaire total wealth, something like five to six trillion dollars. So that wouldn't work at all. Even if you tax everyone who's not a billionaire, you're not going to get anywhere close to $220 trillion. Then why not just declare a debt jub jubilee and cancel all U.S. government debt? The problem with this is it would instantly bankrupt Americans and non-Americans everywhere. So the U.S. government issues a government bond, what's called a treasury, U.S. treasuries, in order to borrow money. A U.S. government bond is a liability of the U.S. federal government. In other words, it's debt or a liability of the government, but it's an asset to the person who buys it or owns it. And that person might be your retired parents or grandparents or an American corporation like Apple, which has treasuries on their balance sheet, or a foreign corporation or a foreign government or central bank. And so if you cancel this debt, if you have a debt jubilee, in other words, this would also be under the category of a debt default where the debt's not paid back. If you do this, if you cancel the debt or try to cancel the debt, you end up blowing a massive hole in the savings of people and entities all around the world. You end up with a daisy chain of defaults and bankruptcies because all of a sudden this asset that they think they own is worth nothing because the U.S. government has defaulted on the debt. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support this channel mission. Hit the subscribe button, leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. Also share this video with a friend or a family member or maybe a coworker. So what's the solution? Well, the temporary solution, the solution of the past two decades has been to just kick the can down the road, have the government issue new debt to pay off the old debt. And in this way, the U.S. dollar really is the ultimate Ponzi scheme. It's not Bitcoin that's the Ponzi scheme, it's fiat money. At some point, though, the strategy would no longer work because the world would no longer want to buy U.S. government debt, at least not at the interest rate that the government is willing to pay. So, for example, I'd happily own a few U.S. treasuries if they paid something like 25 30 percent as an annual yield. But that would quickly, paying those kind of yields or interest rates would quickly, very quickly blow up the U.S. government, much like a household that gorges on high interest debt and gets gets themselves in big financial trouble. At a certain point late in the long-term debt cycle, which is where we are now, the central bank is forced to step in and buy some of this debt that foreign and domestic buyers don't want. This really began in earnest in the wake of the 2008 to 2009 great financial crisis, the GFC. We can see that up until 2009, the U.S. government, I'm sorry, the Fed, the central bank in the U.S., never really owned that many U.S. treasuries, that much U.S. treasuries, under a trillion dollars worth. But as part of the recovery from 
the crisis and as a way of taking these treasuries off the bank's balance sheets and giving them cash instead, they basically began to buy U.S. treasuries. So this is sort of, the Fed is really a private-public partnership, but in one sense, this is one part of the government buying the debt of another part of the government. And at the height in 2022, this got up to 5, 5.7, 5.8 trillion. So we can see we live in very different different times. The Fed has never owned this many treasuries before. And as part of quantitative tightening, they've been trying to let them roll off their balance sheet, which was not good for asset prices, ended up blowing up the U.S. banks. So this is what the Fed's holding on their balance sheet in terms of U.S. treasuries, U.S. government debt. They're also holding a lot of U.S. mortgage-backed securities. These are bundles of uh, sort of structures that bundle up uh, residential mortgages and other kinds of mortgages. And this is a way that the U.S. government manipulates and tries to prop up the U.S. housing market by keeping the financing for your house low. And again, that's been in runoff as well. So this is this is very late stage debt bubble stuff. Now, where does the Fed get the money to buy trillions of dollars of U.S. government debt and these mortgage-backed securities? That's easy. It just prints it. And that's cool, but printing up lots of new money dilutes the holdings of savers who did the actual work to earn that money. It's not fair that some people have to work for money and other people can just print it up because they call themselves central bankers. Central bankers print up new money at the press of a button. Money printing is the main cause of inflation, and it's the mass of money printing from 2020 to 2022 that's behind the inflation that we've been experiencing for the past four years. It's not just a Trump thing. It's not just a Biden thing, though both of them, of course, ran huge deficits and made the problem much worse. But it really is a central banker thing. And those are the bastards that you should be really angry at, not your red or blue neighbors. The only way to hide from this inflation, this, you could also call it monetary debasement, loss of purchasing power of the U.S. dollar because the Fed's printing up too much of it to buy U.S. government debt. The only way to hide and protect yourself and your family's finances from this inflation is to own scarce assets that cannot be printed by central bankers. They can print up as many U.S. dollars as they want, but they cannot print up Bitcoin and they cannot print up gold, which is really kind of an inferior form of Bitcoin. Assets like gold and Bitcoin and stocks and real estate to a lesser extent are places to hide from this money printing. They're scarce assets. Money printing and inflation are really forms of a stealth tax. They pick the pockets of savers and they transfer that economic energy to governments so that those governments can spend it on buying votes, spreading propaganda, and starting and fighting foreign wars. So in summary, the US government spends more money than it brings in in taxes. Other governments do this as well. This is a problem in Europe. This is a problem in Asia. We really have a global uh, debt to GDP bubble. Governments spend more money than they bring in in taxes. To make up the difference, governments borrow money by issuing bonds. Then the central bank buys those bonds with freshly printed money. And this causes regular people to suffer from inflation, which disproportionately affects the working class and lower income people whose wages don't keep up with inflation and who are not familiar with sophisticated inflation hedges like the more wealthy are. And central bankers are quite aware of this. Here's a tweet from the Minneapolis Fed saying, new BLS data finds that low-income households have had about a 10% faster inflation rate than average, that in other words, than the middle class or the upper classes over time. So this really does disproportionately affect the poor. So as we've seen, we can't tax our way out of this mess. You can you could confiscate the wealth of all the U.S. billionaires. It'd still just be a drop in the bucket. And we also can't go the debt jubilee route because that would blow a hole in everyone's balance sheet. The really way, the only way out of this mess is to find a bunch of idiots to hold this government debt, these government, U.S. government bonds or other government bonds, and then make sure that you keep inflation higher than the yield or return on those bonds. So for example, in the U.S. bondholders may think they're making about 4%, but true inflation is probably much more like 8% or more than this. If I'm making 4% on my money every year holding a U.S. Treasury, but the purchasing power of the underlying money is going down by 8% or more, I'm actually losing 4% on my money every year, not even counting the taxes you usually have to pay on that interest income on that yield. So this difference between the 8% and the 4%, that 4% difference is government theft from you that helps them lower their government debt load. And this is what people mean when they say that the US government requires negative real rates, in other words, nominal rates adjusted for inflation to be less than zero, to be negative in order for it to be able to survive and not blow up its finances. This is also called inflating your way out of debt. And it worked well for the U.S. from 2020 to 2023. It wasn't a very pleasant thing for consumers, but by running 
an inflationary regime, the U.S. was able to lower their debt, its debt load from 132% of GDP in the second quarter of 2020 down to about uh, 115% as of the second quarter of 2023, just by having all this inflation run hot in the U.S. So again, this is called inflating your way out of debt. It's the only practical political solution, and this is the route that the U.S. is going to go, unfortunately, because it's really the only way. You can try to be the politician who tells retirees that they're not going to get their Social Security or Medicare paychecks. You can try to be the politician who tells the U.S. military that it doesn't get paid this month, but then you're just going to get voted out and replaced by someone who's willing to take the inflationary way out instead. Another name for keeping U.S. government bond yields below the rate of inflation, and of course the Fed does this by buying bonds and lowering the yield on them, but another name for this is financial repression, and it's how the U.S. got out of its debt after World War II. It basically screwed bondholders for 10 years after the war by keeping inflation much higher than the interest rates that savers were being paid. So this is where we're headed today, more and more inflation. Everyone who's financially sophisticated knows it. Even central bankers understand this. Financial repression only works if you can get enough idiots to hold your bonds and thus steal money from them. If people are able to hold Bitcoin instead of bonds, this financial repression ends up making them rich instead, or at least as a good inflation hedge. If people have an exit, they will use it. This is what Christine Lagarde, who's the head of the ECB, she understands this very well. And I think it's the real reason that she hates Bitcoin, saying there has to be regulation, this has to be applied and agreed upon at a global level, because if there is an escape, that escape, that exit will be used. And this is really what concerns bankers the most about Bitcoin. U.S. central bankers understand this quite well, too. And this brings us to this paper, which was published, of course, by the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. The president and CEO of it is Neil Kashkari, where, whom we know well from the last couple of years. He was the guy who reminded everyone during 2020 that there's an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. He was basically speaking the quiet part out loud. And he still pretends when he goes on interviews to say that he doesn't see a legitimate use case for Bitcoin and comparing it to Beanie Babies. But as this tweet points out, call me crazy, but a lifeboat offering refuge from the perpetual depreciation of the U.S. dollar represents a significant use case. And we know that Neil Kashkari knows these things because the Minneapolis Fed, where he is the CEO, published this paper, which I alluded to at the beginning of this video, unique implementation of permanent primary deficits. In other words, deficits run by the federal government. And we'll just look at the, the abstract here. In an economy with incomplete markets, that is an economy that doesn't have Bitcoin, and consumers who are sufficiently risk averse, in other words, people, frogs who are too stupid to own Bitcoin and thus avoid being boiled slowly alive. In an economy with incomplete markets, i.e. no Bitcoin, and dumb consumers and dumb investors who are sufficiently risk averse, holding US treasuries is not truly risk averse, we show that the government can uniquely implement a permanent primary deficit using nominal debt and continuous Markov strategies for primary deficits and payments to debt holders. In other words, in a world without Bitcoin, the governments can run permanent deficits where they consistently spend more than they bring in. But this result fails if there are also useless pieces of paper, Bitcoin for short, well, they're quite useful. If they weren't useful, the central bankers wouldn't be so worried about them. This result falls short. This primary, this endless deficit spending cannot be done if you have Bitcoin, which they call useless pieces of paper that can be traded. If there is trade in Bitcoin, then there is no continuous Markov strategy for the government that leads to unique implementation. Instead, there's a continuum of equilibria with distinct real allocations, blah, blah, blah. And there's a balanced balance budget trap. Imagine calling balancing the budget a trap, but this is how these people think. And then the abstract ends talking about a legal prohibition against Bitcoin can restore unique implementation of permanent primary deficits, and so can a tax on Bitcoin at the rate of minus uh, parenthesis R minus G being greater than zero. So in other words, you cannot boil the frogs if they have Bitcoin. And the central bankers understand this now. We've been talking about this over the past week. We talked about the ECB paper on Bitcoin and how they're extremely worried about Bitcoin as well. We talked about how Italy is planning to tax the heck out of Bitcoin, as is Denmark, probably beginning in January of 2026, having very, very high taxes on Bitcoin. 
So are you understanding what's happening now? It's very important to understand this is the most important thing that's happening in the financial world. The U.S. government and other indebted governments around the world want to close the exits, in other words, ban or heavily tax Bitcoin so that they can boil the frogs, you and me, by forcing us to hold poor inflation hedges, especially U.S. government debt that yields less than inflation. Close the exits, boil the frogs. The U.S. government passes laws also through regulation, through the regulators that force you to indirectly hold this toxic debt. So regulators force banks to hold it. They force insurance companies to hold US government debt. Your pension is forced to hold it. And then your financial advisor tells you, you should hold this AAA rated US government debt in your retirement portfolio. In other words, these melting ice cubes known as US treasuries. Do you understand now why it's a matter of life and death to own some Bitcoin to protect yourself from the central bankers and the federal government's never-ending deficit spending. They know that we know that they know at this point. And also, do you understand now why you should avoid all fixed income, especially government bonds, and why you should also be fighting the political fight to elect politicians who will fight against high taxes on Bitcoin and will also fight against bans on Bitcoin? Do you understand now why the Bitcoin at Coinbase is going to be seized by the U.S. government at some point as part of this reset? If Bitcoin is freely available and not highly taxed, as this Fed paper itself says, if Bitcoin is freely available and not highly taxed, then governments will not be able to boil you alive like they want to. The nice thing about Bitcoin too, though, is it's highly portable. It's easy to take with you to a more friendly and fair tax jurisdiction, and it's easy to hide it from the frog boilers, unlike gold, unlike stocks, unlike real estate, which are very difficult to move around the world. So you really should get yourself as much Bitcoin as possible while you still can. This is not investment advice, but it's what I've done for myself. And you should also vote for politicians who aren't explicitly against Bitcoin, like Elizabeth Warren and the whole Biden administration. Even if Trump doesn't save us, and he probably won't save us, you'll still end up, you'll still have Bitcoin and all of the optionality that it brings to your life. We need to fight this war on all fronts against those who want to leave us holding their toxic bag of debt and high inflation. Bitcoiners fortunately have this life raft. Everyone else is just going to end up a slowly boiled frog, unfortunately, unless they get on the Bitcoin train. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.